Welcome to the Redeeming Productivity Show. This is the podcast that helps Christians get more done and get it done like Christians. And I am your host, Reagan Rose. Well, it's uh, been a good week. Uh, it's good to be back with you. If you have been following along, or if you have not been following along, I should say, over on the blog, I had a post this week called Your Unconfessed Sin is Killing Your Productivity. If you haven't had a chance to read that, I would encourage you to. Um, I It's something that is near and dear to my heart uh, about the role that um, our holiness of life plays in our ability to get things done to God's glory. So please do check that out. It's a good one, I think, if I can, if I can say that my own post is a good one. Um, but yeah, so I, I want to just get right into this week's episode without much preamble. I uh, On Friday, I shared a link in my Reagan's Roundup feature to an article um, from John Piper. Uh, and by the way, if you don't get the Reagan's Roundup thing, you can sign up for those at redeemingproductivity.com slash newsletter. Every Friday, I send out a uh, list of like five to seven links of different things that I found around the web that I think will be helpful to you in your journey toward becoming a more productive Christian. So check out the Redeem Productivity newsletter, which features Reagan's Roundup. Any whom, um, yeah, so one of the art links I shared was this, I guess it was an interview um, with John Piper called Seven Lessons for Productivity. And if you don't know who John Piper is, uh, he is a well-known speaker, author, uh, DesiringGod.org. If you follow that website, that is his ministry. Um, comes from his 1985 book, Desiring God, and uh, has been very influential in the evangelical world, especially in the realm of uh, New Calvinism and, and things in that regard. And uh, for me, I mean, John Piper was very influential uh, for me uh, in college and reading his books and listening to his sermons. And I definitely have a, a very warm spot in my heart for him of affection. And particularly his book, Don't Waste Your Life, was certainly influential for me uh, in wanting to become a more effective, productive Christian, a better steward of the short life I had, not wanting to waste it, right? I'm sure that many of you, uh, if at a similar experience reading that book. Well, and John Piper is also a massively productive Christian. Um, he has produced countless books. Um, he does, this is actually the interview um, that he did was in the context of his Ask, uh, Pastor John series uh, of podcasts, which there, it was their 1500th episode. And that alone was a great feat of just long-term productivity to produce that many episodes. Um, I, I mean, I just think about that. This is episode 47 of this podcast. I cannot imagine being on episode 1,500. But at any rate, the, the point is, Piper's a productive guy, and, and uh, I, I love Piper. I don't agree with everything um, he's about, but I like him. I appreciate him, and there is no denying that he is a productive Christian. So when a guy like that, a seasoned saint, a seasoned productive uh, minister of the gospel, comes out and offers you seven lessons on productivity, you listen. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to it, I would certainly encourage you to, um, you can find that over in desiringgod.org, seven lessons for productivity. But I thought it would be interesting to kind of go through the seven lessons he offers and I'll just kind of talk about them briefly and then maybe just give a little, a few of my thoughts on them. Um, because I just thought it's such valuable information. It's probably worth <laughs> rehashing a little bit and maybe, uh, going a little deeper on it. So he offers seven lessons for productivity, but there's actually like actually eight. There's sort of this preamble he gives about it as he's beginning. Um, so we'll start with that. And that was the point he made, which was productivity takes a village. And he was just making the point that if you want to accomplish anything meaningful with your life, you are not going to be able to do it alone. And I think that that is absolutely true. You know, he cited uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 21. He says, we're part of a body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. And so uh, I'm, I'm fond of saying that, you know, Christianity is not a, uh, a lone wolf mission, that we were, we're the body of Christ. We're, 
we were made to serve him together, not merely as individuals. And I, I think that this is such a key point Piper makes because if you kind of stride between the two realms of like reading secular personal productivity literature and like trying to understand what the intersection of that with your, your faith is, one of the ways you can kind of um, easily uh, make a mistake is by thinking of it purely in terms of personal productivity, emphasis on the personal. Um, the world's going to really emphasize that it's about you. What can you do? What can you do? Now, obviously we're responsible for ourselves, but it's really important. And I'm glad Piper pointed this out that we think about our ability to accomplish things, to be fruitful in this life, uh, in terms of community, in terms of the church. Um, and he, Piper gave some examples about how supportive his wife was, um, and, you know, even just with desiring God, how they have like a, a staff there and all that they're able to do to kind of make sure that, you know, he's doing all this writing, but they're able to get it out there. Um, and then more importantly, he just emphasized that, you know, what do you have that God hasn't given you? right? You, there's nothing to boast in, even if you're the most productive person in the world and you look back in your life and say, wow, look at all I've built. At the end of the day, all you can say is look what all God did through me and humbly uh, bow to him as the sovereign who did it all and deserves all the glory, not you. Um, so productivity takes a village. I like that. Um, I think that's definitely something I can forget. Sometimes I really like to do things myself, you know, um, and not ask for help. And I think there's pride in that. But if you really want to accomplish something meaningful, you're going to need help. You're going to need a team. So that was sort of the preamble. Then he gets into the one through seven um, lessons on personal productivity. And the first one he gives is know why you are here. Know why you are here. This is a quote, John Piper says, get a clear vision for why everything exists, including yourself. Uh, and he told a little anecdote about how he used to carry around a piece of paper in his pocket in which he'd written uh, the following phrase, you exist to spread a passion for the supremacy of God in all things for the joy of all people. And so he was trying to like fixate in his mind uh, why he was here, why what he was doing mattered, um, and just really focus on that. Man, I think that that is absolutely critical. And this is probably, in my opinion, the most important lesson he has on here. Know why you're here. Knowing your purpose, knowing your mission in life is the thing that's going to make you into a productive person. Let me explain. It's it's not a matter of all the techniques you learn. It's not a matter of getting up earlier or all those things. All those things matter, right? But you won't do any of them. You will never even seek out ways to become more productive if you don't have fixated in your mind why what you're doing matters and what it is you're here to do. It's so critical. You have to understand that you were put on this earth for a purpose by God. If you get that, the rest of the pieces will fall into place. And over time through life, you kind of discover exactly how you've been made to glorify God. You know, that's the thing people I think ask a lot. Um, it's like, well, what am I here for? Like, what, what exactly is God's will for my life? And you kind of discover that as you go and in different seasons, you know. But I remember, um, actually, when I did college ministry, I did something similar to this where I carried around a personal mission statement, which sounds dorky because it is. But it was a good reminder. I thought really hard about why, why I was here, how I was supposed to glorify God in this season. And it said, I, I'd have to look it up, but I think it said something to the effect of, uh, you exist to glorify God by uh, evangelizing and discipling students or something, something along those lines, really, really simple and concise. And so I could just always remind myself, what are you doing? Why are you here? Well, you're here to glorify God. That's the big mission. But right now, you're here to evangelize and disciple college students. So, yes, know why you're here. That's number one. Um, number two that he says in Lessons for Productivity is embrace your role as a sub-creator. 
Now, first, I thought that he was talking about Subway sandwich artists, you know, those brilliant uh, people who work at the Subway sandwich shop and, you know, you get your, your urban spice bread, you get your spinach, you get your $5 foot long. But actually, he wasn't talking about that kind of sub creator. He was talking about the fact that God is the creator and the maker of all things. And he has created in humans, us, in his image as secondary creator slash makers. And so he Piper quoted Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and keep it. And so this is an aspect of what theologians call the dominion mandate or the creation mandate, um, just this this mission that God put us here to do, to, to rule, subdue, exercise dominion in the creation. And how we do that, a lot of it, is in making, in forming, in fashioning from what God has given us, um, bringing order to those things around us, the natural world, and our lives. And in fact, if you're interested in that topic, my friend Miska and I, we have another podcast that's called How Should a Man Live? You can just look that up on your podcast player. And we talk about this a lot, the implications of the creation mandate. It's a little weird, but I think you're going to like it. It's called How Should a Man Live? But um, just focusing in on the point here, embrace your role as a sub-creator. You were made to make right? Um, I quote Ephesians 2.10 here all the time that we're, we're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're, we're made to do things, to make things. And Piper's emphasis was that you have to think of yourself in this way. If you want to be productive, you have to embrace your role as someone who was made to make. Um, and that when you do that, you start to take pleasure in those things, uh, in, in, in writing, in, in, art in um homemaking in uh you know your work and and thinking about yourself as a craftsman who just as god so um did such a great and amazing and perfect job in making this world he looked on it and said that is good uh we too should have that attitude of thinking of ourselves as makers made in the image of god who is a creative god who As we make things, we want to do that well, and we want to enjoy it and take pleasure in it and and embrace that. Um, Yeah, that's that's huge. Um, I talk about this a little bit more. I've probably talked about this in other episodes, but in my Institute for Church Leadership course, this is a big part. I think I do a whole week lesson on this about being creators made in the image of a creator. Um, And that's uh, if you go to... Institute for Church Leadership. If you look that up, you can find my course on stewardship and productivity. Um, but then Piper moves on. He says, number three, three is discover the difference between sloth and rest. Discover the difference between sloth and rest. He says, and I quote, we need to discover and embrace with zeal the difference between sloth and rest, laziness and leisure. Man, that is huge, isn't it? Like, think about that. Do you know the difference between sloth and rest? Between laziness and leisure? Do you know the difference between, um, you know, your needed rest uh, that God has made you to require and when you're being lazy? He doesn't, I wish that he had talked more on this. I would listen to an hour of someone talking on the difference between those two because it's hard to tell sometimes, isn't it? It's hard to tell sometimes when you go too far and when you're, um, Instead of just resting well, you're, um, you're in the realm of laziness. Um, you know, oftentimes when I'm talking to people about uh, productivity and stuff, this comes up. I mean, I think almost any time that I've been interviewed by somebody on, the to- on this topic, people ask about the role of rest in productivity. And I usually say that I think that there's two types of, of Christians. I mean, we're all prone to both of these mistakes, but I think generally people tend towards one or the other. Um, there are those who never rest and that is a problem. And there are those who love to talk about rest because they're lazy. Right. And knowing the difference between those two is pretty critical because you don't want to tell a person who is already given to laziness. You don't want to just go on and on and on about how much you need rest. And, you know, God made Sabbath for man and not man for the Sabbath. And you just really need to, you need to rest more because some people don't need to rest more. They need to get off their butts and (laughs) actually do something with their lives. But then there's those other people who never take a break. 
And that's an equally um, bad mistake because you will burn out, but not just because you'll burn out. Um, there's an attitude behind that that can be wrong. This attitude that I can do it all, that I'm omnipotent. I'll push myself a little harder and then I'll get more done. And it doesn't embrace uh, the reality of your creatureliness, of your need for God, um, of the fact that you're not omnipotent. Only God is. Uh, there's a great book by Christopher Ashe called Zeal Without Burnout. And in that, he, he says that very thing, that rest is a reminder of our creatureliness. It's designed by God to show us that we, we, uh, we're not all powerful. So that, that was a good one. Discover the difference between sloth and rest. And number four, he says, make peace with imperfection. Uh, as Piper, I quote him, he says, we must not be paralyzed by perfection and infinity. And then he had a quote by the historian Arnold Toynbee, who said, all human work is imperfect because human nature is. And this intrinsic imperfection of human affairs cannot be overcome by procrastination, <laughs> which is a great quote. I love that. <laughs> like it's all imperfect. Like humans are imperfect. Therefore our work's imperfect and imperfection isn't going to be overcome by procrastination. And the, the point of that quote, if you, you know, haven't really thought it all the way through yet is he's saying that oftentimes we, um, we are paralyzed because we really want to make sure that everything we do is absolutely perfect. And what this, what that turns into is procrastination. And so instead of being perfect, we end up doing nothing. And that's just silly. That's absolutely silly. And so Viber says, you need to make peace with that fact. <clears throat> You need to make peace with the fact that you, your job while you're here is to speak the truth. It's to, to be a Christian in this world and to serve God as best as you can. And you're going to do that imperfectly. I mean, even your best good works are going to be tinged with sin. Much, much less just, you know, imperfection. You're not going to do it perfect. So uh, you have to kind of just not embrace that, but be at peace with it, he says. And I think this is like a big one for me and I'm probably for a lot of you guys too is perfectionism man it is so deadly you know I I've, I've been I've sit on projects for so long because they're just not perfect I have two probably almost three like book length projects that I have almost completely done for years that I've just set aside because I'm afraid that it's not perfect. I'm afraid to just put it out there or to, you know, put the finishing touches on it and be done with it. And I just go back, you know, and I kind of noodle on it and I rearrange the chapters and I start rewriting it from the start. I'm like, no, this time will be it. But that's just so bad. You know, like you can't treat every project that you do in life. Like it's going to be your magnum opus. Like this is the thing you're going to be remembered by. Because think about it, look at, look at people, look at a guy like, like John Piper, who I said is, is, you know, incredibly productive. He's written so many books and they're not all great, <laughs> you know, but he just kept doing it. And he has this life of work behind him. If you ever look at uh, Martin Luther, the reformer, go, go look up his, the works of Martin Luther. They've compiled all the stuff they have from him. I can't remember how many volumes it is. I want to say it's something like 17. It's probably more than that. Honestly, I'm going to look it up real quick. Uh, works of Martin Luther. I'm Googling how many volumes. Holy cow. It's 55 volumes. The works of Martin Luther is 55 volumes. And that's, I mean, you know, given the times and stuff that probably not even all that he wrote. So here's a guy, 55, and they're not thin. If you look at them in a library, they're not thin books. Or you think of John Owen, you have his works, I think it's 18 volumes, um, Puritan, like you just have a ton of stuff or, 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 you know, John MacArthur, he's got just uh, probably over a hundred books. And, uh, you know, I know this, he's got 3,400 sermons. That's 3,400 hours of, of sermon material. He's got the commentaries. Like there are these people that have been prolific, with their life and their writing and their work. How did they do it? Because they produced, because they shipped stuff when they were done with it. They didn't put it on a shelf and say, it's not perfect yet. So I, I think this is big, making peace with imperfection. Um, obviously you gotta have this attitude. I'm gonna do as good of a job as possible, but at some point there's gotta be a deadline. You've gotta turn the thing in and you gotta be done with it and move on to the next thing. Number five, he says, act promptly. Um, he talked about some different people, historical figures that talked about this a lot. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Jonathan Edwards. Um, 
He said, fruitful thoughts might come to you in the middle of the night or while you're doing something else, you're out playing. Um, You know, it's a common thing, you know, the shower thoughts thing where you have this great idea when you're in the shower and by the time you're done, you've forgotten it. Uh, I've had that experience. And what he was saying, acting promptly, he said, when, when something comes to you or you have some big insight, start working on it right away. Get out a pen and pad, get out your computer and start working at it. Um, you have to seize on that stuff before it's gone. And I think just practically, uh, you've got to have tools in your life for this. Like it could just be a notebook by the side of your bed um, or even <laughs> by the shower. Um, but Or you can have voice memos on your phone. I use a little app called Drafts for iOS. It's just the fastest way to open up a blank note and start typing. Um, or even just a scrap piece of paper. You just never know when something's going to come to you and the ideas are going to be flowing. Or even, you know, I talked about um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, stewarding motivation. Like when motivation comes, how do you manage that? How do you utilize those waves of motivation? Um, but you you have to capitalize on the muse, <laughs> you know? Uh, you obviously don't want to make a habit on it where your whole life gets interrupted all the time by these big, huge things. But I mean, just for me, this doesn't happen all that often. But there are times when I will not be able to sleep and I'll be noodling on some idea and like it'll all just, I don't know, like click into place, you know? <laughs> And it all makes sense. And I have to jump up then and I have to open up my laptop and I have to just start writing about it because if I don't, it'll be gone tomorrow. So act promptly was number five. Uh, Number six, he said, chop a little each day, chop a little each day. And so he's using the metaphor of, uh, of an ax and that you could cut down a tree by swinging the ax once a day at the tree and eventually it would fall. Uh, There's a quote, he said, we need to be deeply persuaded that steady small chops with a good sharp axe will almost certainly, after a few hundred blows, bring down a very big tree. And so he gave the example in his life how, you know, he would want to read these big novels, but he's always been a slower reader. Um, And so he just committed to reading 15 minutes a day. And then lo and behold, he got through them. Um, I've heard, I've heard him talk about this before and I, um, about the whole swinging at a tree thing, uh, in different contexts. And I've definitely taken that away. And that really is a big part of why, um, I write one blog post every week. It's a, it's a very small thing, like in the grand scope of thing. Like I could write seven a week. I could write probably 10 a week, you know, but it would take up a lot of time and it would be very unsustainable. But this is, I think just the heart of faithfulness, just showing up, doing the thing day in, day out. And when I was starting Redeeming Productivity back in seminary, uh, maybe five years ago, four years ago, uh, my friend Miska, who I do the other podcast with, um, he encouraged me to start a blog. Excuse me. And he said, uh, well, I complained to him. I said, I don't have any time. Like, I can't, like, go and start writing much. And he said, well, well, if you only write once a week, you'll have 52 blogs in a year. He said, that's 52 articles that could be helpful to people. And that little piece of advice, uh, combined with, with what I'd heard Piper talking about with the chopping a little bit each day, that was what got me started. And here I am four years later. I mean, it's not like super successful or anything, but I know that I've helped people because people email me and, uh, it's, it's cool to see that just a little bit of, uh, time, a little bit of effort every week makes a difference. And this can be true, of course, in personal habits. This is why I emphasize so much the value of morning routines. Um, if you read four chapters a day from the Bible, you read the Bible in a year. Uh, if you pray every day, you'll have prayed 365 days in a year. Um, you know, if you write one entry in your journal a day, you'll be blowing through that journal. Uh, read 10 pages a day. Anyway, like all these little things, chop a little each day, you will accomplish so much more than trying to do things in fits and spurts, waiting for, you know, motivation to come. So love that. Number six was chop a little each day. And then finally, number seven was get excited for what's ahead. He says, get excited for what's ahead. Uh, this, I, you know, most of these I'd probably thought about before, you know, to some degree, like, like none of this is like, was earth shattering. Know why you're here. Embrace your role as sub creator. Yeah, I mean, all all these I'd thought about before, but this last one, I don't think I'd ever really thought of this. And I think it's so like 
essential to being productive that this is this is probably the biggest takeaway for me that I just want to noodle on some more and try to apply. So number seven was get excited for what's ahead. Uh, and this is a quote. Piper said, never get to the point in your life where you are contented, where you're more contented with what you have already done than you are excited with what is yet to be done. Man, this is like secret sauce stuff here. Because you wonder, how, how does a guy, how does a guy write a book like Desiring God and then turn around and write like a hundred more after that? Like that's, it's a good book. If you haven't read Desiring God, read it. How do you write that? You write that in 85 or released in 85. And then he's been prolific ever since. And he's old, you know, he's old and he is still writing stuff. You know, they turned around that book on coronavirus and Christ in like three days or something. Uh, if you saw that, the coronavirus happened, like, and they came out with a book, uh, Piper came out with a book, like almost instantly. And you're like, what happened? How did he do that? Does he have a hyperbolic time chamber? <laughs> but how do you not rest on your laurels is what I'm saying. Because this is totally my tendency. If I get through a big, huge project, if I do something real massive, I'm like, time to celebrate me for a while. You know, and I just want to take a break. And I want to look back at that and be like, yep, mm -hmm, yep, oh, I did it. And I think I definitely, like, it's good to celebrate your wins. It's good to celebrate um, and look on your work, like I said, and, and like, like God did and say, that's good. That's very good. And be, and be proud in a, in a non-sinful way about what you've accomplished, what you've built. I think we're made for that. It's part of the satisfaction of work. But you got to look at what's the next big thing. What's the next thing you're going to do? And, um, man, he says, never get to the point in your life where you're more contented with what you've already done then you are excited for what is yet to be done. And this is like um, something you have to cultivate, I think. I think you have to cultivate this. You have to actively train your thinking. Um, so when you finish something, celebrate it, take the win, and then look ahead and say, okay, now what can I sink my teeth into? That was big, but what else can I do? What can I do next? How else can I serve God in this season? And keep looking for that next hill to take. Keep looking for that next good work to do. Keep looking for those things. Because our lives are not our own. We were bought at a price. The price of Christ's blood. And as servants of him, as people who were not bought cheaply, we've got work to do. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a good worker. I want to be a good steward of this life for my God's glory. And I can only do that in his help. And I can only do that in a village. But anytime I can get little bits of advice like this on how to do that better, I will take them and run with them. Uh, so I hope some of those things were helpful for you. Uh, definitely go check out the article. I'll link to it in the description, but it's called Seven Lessons for Productivity, and it's part of uh, the Ask Pastor John series on Desiring God. Um, but that's all I have for you this week. Um, please, if you have any questions, any thoughts, anything at all, email me at reagan at redeemingproductivity.com. Love to hear from you all. And do, if you like this podcast, if you love this podcast, if this podcast has fundamentally changed your attitude towards matter and the universe, please give it a five-star rating on the podcast app of your choice. Helps people to find it. Um, and also, I'll mention again the newsletter. Get that newsletter. You're making a huge mistake if you don't. It's at redeemingproductivity.com slash newsletter, or there is a link in the description. Well, I'll see you again here next week. And until I do, remember this, in whatever you do, do it well and do it all to the glory of God. <laughs>